Namaskar, Hare Krishna, and welcome, dear ladies and gentlemen, to the Indian Consulate here in Durban, the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center more specifically, as well as the DUT and Eastern Eye Magazine in collaboration. would like to extend a heartfelt uh, gratitude to you all for taking the time out on this Monday afternoon to be here to celebrate International Women's Day. And as you know that in South Africa, our specifics lie and rest more um, pertaining to the month of August, where we celebrate our South African Women's Day. And I think we all know the history behind that and how that has become such a permanent mark within our community and understanding how women have come together to bring about democracy within our sphere. But we also cannot uh, shy away from honoring the women on an international level. And I think therefore we are all here gathered here this afternoon to place importance on the significance of how women have uh, forged the way forward in so many spheres. And therefore, thank you for being here to acknowledge International Women's Day with us. A special word of welcome I'd like to um, acknowledge Mr. Logi Naidu, and I think we all know without introduction, and also um, Ms. Ella Gandhi for being here with us this afternoon and giving off your time. We've got an exciting lineup of speakers, and I think it's going to be informative and inspirational. Um, so I would like to go directly into the program without uh, further ado. And on that note, I'd like to welcome Advocate Robin Sula from the Department of Journalism, Durban University of Technology. Thanks very much indeed, Program Director. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A little bit uh, strange saying gentlemen, uh, but you don't say lovely ladies. You know, and it's something we must think about. I'm also, if I may use the word, bemoan the fact that you know, we're here at a ladies' function, Women's Day function, and yet there are more ladies than men. Um, yet we should be targeting men as well. Um, and I know men were invited, but the fact they're not here tells us loads of equality in our society, but I'll come back to that in a short while. I welcome you on behalf of the Indian Cultural Center, like the program director said, uh, DUT Journalism from where I come, as well as the Eastern Eye, uh, that's Sunita Singh. <coughs> happy birthday, Sunita. And I always want to say happy birthday when you turn 21. So, happy birthday. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> as the program director did say, you know, we got an exciting lineup, uh, but uh, Dr. Yogi said to me, do not write a speech, Robin. If you write a speech, it'll be too long. And I said, thank you, doctor, because if I don't write a speech, at least I can speak for a longer period of time. <laughs> so yeah, I go. I just want to make a few comments, which I hopefully are relevant <laughs> about women. And I'm here, I stand here, and I talk before you in solidarity to support and for the strength of women and women's causes. I think it's very, very important that we, we recognize that for various reasons. And the, and the one comment and the initial comment I like to make and the most important comment I, I would regard as, when women and men apply for a piece of job or anywhere, oftentimes we look at a woman's qualification. What is she qualified in? Does she have formal education? Informal education, non-formal education is uh, irrelevant. When you look at the other sex, so to speak, the man, you say, what is his potential for the occupation, for the job? It's a huge difference. <coughs> and we need to keep that in mind. Secondly, you know, the whole issue of leadership. Whether you're a housewife, whether you're in academia, whether you're a medical practitioner, whether you're a lawyer, whoever you are, I always believe you're a leader wherever you are. And you can lead from where you are as a woman. And I don't mean men cannot lead from women, but women especially. You don't need to be sitting on a board of directors. You don't need to be heading up a department or an organization for that matter. But lead from wherever you are. That's extremely important, I would say. The whole notion of advocacy and lobbying. I think as women, sometimes you, you shy away from the opportunity to advocate for something 
that's in your best interest and in the best interest of all women concerned. So we need to get that in place. And yeah, we're not talking about entitlement. Yeah, we're talking about based on your skill, based on your talent, based on what you can deliver, you should be advocating and lobbying for what you deserve is due to you. The fourth point I'd like to make also is about equality. And I don't want to go too much into it. But we talk about equality, we talk about narrowing the gender gap, the gender balance, gender diversity. But the very important thing again about equality is about tokenism. Okay, there's five men on the board, let's get a lady. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, with due respect I say this, the lady will be somebody who's weak in society. The perception that she's weak, so we can manipulate her. Okay, I sit on a board, I sit as a deputy chair of a board, and there's a lady that's a chair. She gets all my support, and she's not a token there. And I think that's very, very important to keep in mind. The other important thing to bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we talk about stereotyping. How do we debunk the whole notion of stereotyping? Okay? The old one, women are bad drivers. Okay? Uh, I was just saying to Sunita earlier on, with the, with the rain, the unexpected rain yesterday, often I'm saying unexpected, but I didn't expect it to rain so hard. Within half an hour, there were six cars that overturned. And I, I found out that six of those drivers were all male. Okay, so it tells you something. So, so, so we got to look at. I was telling my students this morning, by the way. I don't know what happens to people when it rains. They tend to drive faster. And I was saying to them in a joke. I hope they got it as a joke. That water seems to affect people more than liquor affects them. When they drive. Well, that's another day's discussion. The other point is support. We talk about support for women from all sectors, from everybody. But dare I say it, ladies and gentlemen, that we also need women to support women. Absolutely important to keep that in mind. Okay? Um, you know, oftentimes we, we're looking for a scapegoat, we're looking for what's beyond us, but the enemy is standing right next to you. The elephant is in the room, so to speak. Okay? So keep that in mind. And then finally, and I have to say this from where I come, you need to tell your stories, no matter who you are. Okay, I'm in journalism, I'm involved in publishing. You all have a story to tell. No matter how old you are, no matter what profession you are in. Get your stories out, you need to leave a legacy. Not just for your community, but also for your own family. Write your stories. Do not write a 200 page book, you can write a 60 page book, 72 pages, etc. I'm more than happy to assist and, and uh, you in that regard. But tell your story, write your stories, and let the whole world get to know about it. In welcoming you, ladies and gentlemen, my final word to you, and words should I say, I don't believe that Women's Day is just one day, whether it's the 8th of March or the 9th of August. As I tell everybody, Women's Day is every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Advocate Robbins, you know, and I think that's such an apt introduction. I'm so glad that um, you had delivered our welcoming remarks because I think that there's so many pertinent points that were raised at, uh, through that introduction. And especially for me personally, and I think one of the, the aspects that we shy away from is the camaraderie and sisterhood between women, that we don't <laughs> like to address it. And uh, coming from a man himself, okay, I think uh, that's actually well done to you. Um, and I've also realized that I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> so forgive me for that. <laughs> My name is Krishangirade Dasi and uh, I am the Public Relations Officer for the Hare Krishna Temple in Chatsworth. Um, I'm also the Minister for the Women's Forum for the Hare Krishna Temple, ISKCON, in South Africa and the Chairperson for the um, ISKCON Durban Women's Forum based here in Chatsworth. By profession, I'm an educator, and oh, beyond that, I think um, my passion and my love lies being a mother of my two daughters. So we wear many hats, and I must say to Kripa Deva, also welcome, um, and you know, to so many of us here who also wear those many hats, and then many unsung heroes seated right next to us. So we'd like to hear more and share more uh, as the afternoon develops also. Uh, I would now like to introduce a video on Sister Nivedita, who is uh, actually the focus is on Sister Nivedita this afternoon, 
where she is also quite an uh, unsung hero who's now become more coming more to the fore and to the front and uh, i will not say much more on that because i'd let the video take over and i think visuals are so much better than a person standing behind a mic but i've come across this book and uh, also there is some literature now presented on sister nivedita but i would leave that to the video so i'd now hand over to our av if you could begin the video for us thank you She was once asked, "What will be your future work in India?" She replied, "My life is given to India. In it, I shall live and die." And she lived up to this aspiration. The memorial plaque on her samadhi rightly reads, "Here we pose Sister Nivedita, who gave her all to India." National snippet on Sister Nivedita and her life talent. I think what we can take away from there is that even. in her last will and testament that she had bequeathed everything in terms of leaving um her life and her legacy towards women and education as well as holistic development of children whether it was in the art in education in spirituality and i have to mention that actually uh she passed on in 1911 so we have, if we do a quick calculation we know to that um this is the 152nd uh, anniversary of her birth okay and not as 150 years as the video had uh, mentioned uh, quite inspirational in terms of her lifetime and her contribution to not only women in india but i think a legacy left for women all around the world on that note i'd like to invite uh, guest speaker Dr Usha Shukla who's uh, retired from the University of KwaZulu Natal and she's been teaching Hindi for most of her life as she says and she does uh, belong to the cluster of language and ling linguistics may I welcome Dr Usha Shukla uphold the rights of men and women especially the latter in keeping with manu's injunctions the manu smriti was widely diffused throughout the ancient world however ancient cultures adopted patriarchal patterns of male control and domination over women relegating them to the position of chattels according to manu where women are honored there the gods are pleased where they are not honored all work becomes fruitless but history and tradition show otherwise the problems encountered by hindu women were due to patriarchal approach to the patriarchal approach of seeing value and significance in women only in relation to men on the one hand women are elevated to the status of goddess and on the other are reviled and relegated to virtual servitude from ancient times this paradox is evident through tradition and history this can only be resolved on a spiritual and metaphysical level where a higher call of duty or dharma overrides the subjective perspective of women even to this present day while more women have been empowered over the generations there is still a dire need to empower women spiritually economically physically and that comes from a whole and wholesome education equal education both secular and spiritual we need to remember that in the early days education <coughs> for women was encouraged the devi mahatma says all forms of knowledge are aspects of the and all women throughout the world are thy form in the book called great women of india dedicated to the holy mother sri sharda devi there is much said about the great women <coughs> from vedic times like maitreyi gargi arundhati etc to women of the modern age those women could hold their own in the times that they lived in Ma Sharda Devi 
attain to the highest degree of spiritual realization and serve the spiritual needs of thousands of seekers well after the death of a husband and master, Sri Ramakrishna. Yet, today with these examples of great women before us, we still hanker for equality, empowerment, spiritual upliftment and success. And while women all over the world have attained the highest success in their fields, uh, lots of women I mean, much more needs to be done to level the fields. There is no difference in the spiritual or ritual potencies of boys and girls. No wonder that Maithili Sharan Gupt in his Hindi ep uh, epic Saket, based on the Ram story, talks of King Janak's spiritual heights which made him realize that his daughters were worth more than a hundred sons. Proper education and guidance were needed. In ancient times, women enjoyed equal opportunities for work and education. However, at various times in our history, education of women was sadly neglected, causing women to lapse into illiteracy and hopelessness. With that brief background, let us look at the spiritual entitlement of women, which is the theme for today. Nivedita means dedicated to God or the spiritual realm. Margaret Noble, as we've already learned from the video of Ireland, was drawn to Swami Vivekananda after coming across him in London. Both were of the view that the soul has no gender, hence there should be no barrier to spiritual pursuit. Margaret became Nivedita when she became the disciple or the Shishya of Swami Vivekananda and also became known as his spiritual daughter. As the perfect and true disciple, she imbibed everything accordingly. Swami Vivekananda gave his manifesto in the form of an address to the people of Madras on his return from Chicago in, nine, in 1894. This address was called in defense of Hinduism. To him, Hinduism and the welfare of Bharat and all her people were synonymous. Sister Nivedita gained greater recognition for carrying forward the national freedom agenda rather than limiting herself to an ashramite. She also found inspiration in other spiritual luminaries such as Aurobindo and many others that we have already just seen so uh, on the video. She experienced and expressed fully the spiritual entitlement of women and worked for their emancipation. She continued working in the political and sp spiritual dom domain in India after the Mahasamadhi of Swami Vivekananda. A point to be noted, neither Masarita Devi nor Sister Nivedita as examples stopped their spiritual teachings after the, de the death of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. Because Manu had said that a woman must be in the care or protection of a father, husband or son. However, these examples show us and we now know that a spiritually enlightened woman can continue to be of use to society and the nation based on her own strength. Very often, the term entitlement could be construed in a negative way. For example, I'm entitled because I'm a woman, I'm entitled because I belong to a minority group, etc. Entitlement means something due to one out of the sense of common justice applicable to all. The negative connotation of entitlement is the belief that we inherently deserve privileges and special treatment or that we have the right to something whether we deserve it or not. Rights cannot accrue merely because of certain circumstances, even if they did not impact on us. There has to be some demonstrable link. And I believe that all human beings have the right to spiritual entitlement. According to Swami Vivekananda, Sister Nivedita possessed all the qualities 
that were needed to change the destiny of the women of Bharat. She was educated, sincere, pure, immensely loving, determined and disciplined, of sound character with great moral values. Perfect for spiritual entitlement. Sister Nivedita opened the girls' school, went door to door to recruit students. Her vision was to uplift society in an informed way. The student also learns how to become self-sufficient and a useful member of society with a clean mind, in a clean body, in a clean <coughs> environment. The Hindu woman's spirituality was expressed mostly through observing all rituals and traditions. Sister Nivedita awakened Hindu women to the fact that spiritual entitlement or empowerment is a positive right to be identified and exercised, not just incidental to being a woman. Sister Nivedita wanted to do her best for her adopted motherland, Bharat, with no selfish motive. She loved India immensely. She wanted Bharat to live up to its description as the cradle of spirituality. She wanted to change the plight of women, empower them in every sense of the word, and is, as he said, that we educate, uh, we educate women and you educate a nation. <coughs> However, at that time, men were not really interested in the upliftment of women. Women were simply house and family caretakers, nothing more. Women, <coughs> sorry, I am reminded here of Jay Shankar Prasad's epic poem, Kamayani, in Hindi. And I'll quote the lines. Manu, tum shraddha ko gaye bhool, bhool gaye purushatva moha me kuch satta hai nari ki, samarasta hai sambandh bani adhikar aur adhikari ki. That means Prasad ji makes it clear that like all men, Manu forgot shraddha. She is not given the status by Manu, either spiritual or temporal. Manu, you have forgotten shraddha. In your male patriarchal delusion, you have forgotten that women also have some status, some power and being. You have also forgotten that equality or samrasta is based on relationships between the rights and the possessor of rights, that is between males and females. There is much more to women. Sister Nivedita knew and she worked tirelessly to improve the quality of their lives, their interaction in and contribution to society and Bharat at large. But underlying all these, Sister Nivedita tried to make them understand that spiritual entitlement is as much the right of women as it is the right of their male counterparts. Behind every successful woman is a woman. <laughs> Sister Nivedita lends credibility to the same. And it is very important to note that while spiritual entitlement is the right of every woman, spiritual enlightenment, the difference between entitlement and enlightenment, um, spiritual enlightenment is an outcome of deep constant engagement with the values of spirituality which informs the total personality of the individual. The message, the aura, the vibrations of the spiritually evolved person speaks to the world directly. When you, when you meet somebody who is spiritually evolved, you can feel it, you can see it. I salute all the great women and men from ancient times to date who worked for the emancipation and the upliftment of women. Sister Nivedita being one of the many. Let us emulate them and move our focus from and move our focus from only success to significance so that we can live in a more positive and better world. I think all of us should uh, should remember that being successful is a wonderful thing, 
but it is more important to be significant in society than being worried about success. So that, um, sorry, our own attitude, when I speak of our own attitude, I'm talking about women, sense of self-worth and moral values are adequate to place us on the path to liberate ourselves. And um, Advocate had stolen my line <coughs> at the beginning, but I'll still read it anyway. Sometimes women are their own enemies. We tend to keep each other down by our behavior instead of sending out love and support to uplift each other, right? So I'd like to say to everyone, especially the women here, happy Women's Month, sisters. Let us empower each other so that we may live in a more spiritually charged world. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Usha Shukla, and I think such inspiring words this afternoon to both the women and men seated here. And uh, so much coming through in terms of the Manu Sumita and the other scriptures that have been revealed to us. And I think the pastimes are there for a specific reason. And based on those pastimes and interpretations and purports, we understand that these pastimes have left us with examples to follow. And I think that's important for us to understand that entitlement is there Whereas these pastimes and this wonderful woman without false ego being attached should be understood in a spiritual way. Where like Sita Devi, for instance, in the Ramayana, there's so much in the story of the Ramayana that has to offer in just her actions and her lifetime and how she had handled the situations presented to her. So, so much of wealth in our Vedas and in our uh, literature that have been brought to the fore by Dr. Usha Shukla this afternoon. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, Shristi from the Indian Consulate to recite a poem and the poem is significant to our afternoon also as uh, this is a poem by Swami Vivekanand offering special blessings to Sister Nivedita. Shristi. Namaskar. I'm going to recite a poem today written by Swami Vivekananda for Sister Nivedita entitled Blessings. The mother's heart, the hero's will, the softest flowers, sweetest feel, the charm and force that ever sway, the altar's fire, flaming plate, the strength that leads in love obeys, far reaching dreams and patient ways. Eternal faith in self, in all. The divine life, the, the divine in, in great, in small. All these and more than I could see. Today, may mother grant to thee, Swami Vivekananda. I'm also going to recite five quotations by Sister Nivedita. Quotation number one. If the many and the one be indeed the same reality, then it is not all modes of worship alone, but equally all modes of work, all modes of struggle, all modes of creation, which are parts of realization. No distinction henceforth between sacred and secular. To labor is to pray, to conquer is to renounce. Life itself is religion, to have and to hold as stern a trust as to quit and to avoid. Quote two, the world's work is great sadhana, wherein we accumulate character by which when the time comes to raise, even into the nirvikalpa samadhi itself, character is self-restraint. Self-restraint is self-direction. Self-direction is concentration. Concentration when perfect is samadhi. From perfect work to perfect mukti. This is the swing of the soul. Let us then be perfect in work. Quote three. 
Back to simplicity and the lofty uses of simplicity. Back to the bias of that of beauty and the depth of thought that meant culture. Back to the mat on the bare floor and the thoughts that were so lofty. Let us ordain ourselves free of the means of living. Let us give our whole mind to the developing the life itself. Quotes for, unless we train the feelings and the choice, our man is not educated. He is only decked out in his certain intellectual tricks that he has learned to perform. By these tricks, he can earn his bread. He cannot appeal to the heart or give life. He is not a man at all. He is a cleaver. A <laughs> Quote number four, five. All power is in the human mind. We can master anything simply by giving our attention to it. Thank you. Happy Women's Day and Mom's Thank you, Shruti. I'd now like to invite uh, Sister Usha Jeevan from the Brahma Kumaris in Durban. <coughs> Just a bit about Sister Usha Jeevan. She's been um, with the Brahma Kumaris for over 30 years um, and brings about with her meditation experience, especially in the form of Raja Yoga. And uh, also, this Brahma Kumaris, as we all know, is administrat administrated by women. So this is very special for us to have Sister Usha Jeevan here with us this afternoon. Thank you. Known to my brothers and sisters. Today I don't have a written speech, but I thought it's appropriate just to speak from the heart because spirituality doesn't really come from any books. But what I want to really focus on is looking at Bharat because our emphasis really is to see how Sister Navita brought such value back to Bharat. But when we think about Bharat, it's not modern day India. Bharat is actually when all the continents was one piece of land. Hence, whether she was coming from England and her determination to actually help Bharat tells us that we actually have one root. And let's go a little bit further about our brothers and sisters because even that is something very important. If we sit here, we can be very aware of our physical bodies and know that this is the form of a female. But actually, it's only a form that somebody told me and informed me. Actually, there's no label that says I'm a female or a male. And so if we take ourselves beyond this realm, which is our material dimension, and go a little bit beyond it, we'll understand that we're coming from a space we're actually we're talking about energy. That energy is the Atma that doesn't have a gender. And in that dimension, we are truly equal. So then where does this feminine and masculine energy come from, which is so much used in this dimension to make right and wrong, make powerful and weak, to make happy and unhappy? And what is amazing to understand is that if we just look at that element of spirit, which we call the Atman, it has different vibrations that actually makes up this Atman. And if we think about that Atman, it's actually pure light energy. And if you were able to reflect, refract light energy into a prism, you get seven colors of the rainbow. And it's the color that actually holds the vibration. And so the vibration between within each one of us starts from peace, which you can say blue, purity, love, happiness, joy, wisdom, and power. So on the one spectrum, you have power, which is red. And on the other spectrum, you have blue, which is peace. And what's happened is that as an energy, when we come into the physical dimension, we all have that same vibration 
of the seven colors. But in our material body, we manifest that energy a little different. So some of us will be more towards blue side, some more towards red side, some may be very balanced and in the middle. But the important part is that we are a compilation of all the vibrations. It sits in us as we sit here. No one needs to give it to you. No one needs to honor it in you. You need to honor yourself and bring it out inside of you because you are that. Like a simple thing is that we all speak about wanting to be loved, wanting to be respected. But the good news is that you are love. So what is anyone going to love you for? It's about being, isn't it? We are peace. Om Shanti. So the peace that I'm seeking actually lies within me. And the beautiful thing is that on this physical dimension, we play different parts. So I'm going to go into a little bit of philosophy. You can throw tomatoes if you want to, because mm. I got no quotations for you from which book it comes from. But this is our teaching. That actually in the cycle of birth and rebirth, we take two consecutive births as male, or two consecutive births as female, and then we swap. So we will never take more than two births in one gender. Hence, all of us sitting here has an equal opportunity of being both male and female in this dimension. So what woman empowerment do you want to speak about? <laughs> What are we going to talk about? I don't think it's about finding a powerful woman. It's about finding the feminine energy. It's not finding a more respectful man, but allowing his softer, more feminine energy to emerge. That is necessary. So let's just look at it in this way, that when we say we're entitled, what is the entitlement? Generally, if I'm born to someone, I inherit many things. So if we think about ourselves as souls, as energies, who is the parent of that soul? God. And who is God? The unlimited ocean of peace, love, happiness, joy, wisdom, and power. As we sit here, we are all entitled to be peaceful, to be loving, to be pure, to be happy, to be wise, to be in our truth, and to be powerful. Are we going to ask anyone to do that for us? Or are we going to step into it by knowing who we are? So when we forget who we are, we ask somebody else to give us the recognition. But when we realize who we are, we step into the power of who we are. And that's really a simplicity. So we don't have to strive to be like anyone. We just have to be who we are. But if we don't know who we are, then we're following somebody. And we're thinking we need this, we need that, we need to go there, we need to achieve this, we need to and that's where we lose ourselves because in running this red race of somebody else's purpose or attainment, something that is within me which is uniquely in me, the way I manifest those seven qualities in this dimension, there is no one in the world that can do it. You are unique in that respect. So even though we all have the same qualities, how we manifest it is unique. And that's what we need to really feel entitled to do. <coughs> Don't try and do something else somebody else is doing. A good writer doesn't read novels. No. <coughs> and so we also don't need to see what others are doing and be inspired. And this is where meditation is such an important step. Because what we do, we're constantly communicating with our senses out there. And we're taking, consuming information from people outside. So we've become consumers. But actually our nature as a light is to be radiant, to give, 
to sustain, to emanate. So if we're taking and consuming from outside, we can't give. And if we learn the nature of only taking, we become victims. So when we stop taking from our senses, and when we become quiet, so the last um, powerful quotation from Sister Navita is so important about Dhyan. Because Dhyan basically means to give attention. And Dhyan is also remembered as meditation. So what am I paying attention to? To what other people are doing? Or to the light that's inside of me? So there's a really beautiful story about King Janak. And people were amazed that this was an amazing king, but he lived with such ease in such a huge palace. So somebody came to ask him, how can you live in such a liberated way when you have so much of wealth, so much of things, you don't get affected by anything? So he said, okay, I'll show you. He said, what I want you to do is I'm going to give you this little lamb and use this lamb to go around my whole kingdom and have a good look at what is within my kingdom. When you come back, you will understand how I managed to be so uninfluenced. And he said, but just make sure that you mustn't let this lamp get switched off. At no point must it actually be extinguished. So as he's walking through, if you don't want the light to be extinguished, you have to pay so much attention to it. And after his whole journey through the kingdom, he comes back to the king and he says, the king said to him, so did you see the beauty of my kingdom? He said, you know what, I was so focused on this land for it not to get extinguished. I did not actually notice anything. He said, that's the answer. That if I focus on the light, these things are just side things. They're all distractions. And it doesn't mean, I have a cell phone, I have a computer. We don't have to not use what the world offers, but it shouldn't be the thing that distracts me, which is the most important thing. And so in this way, what is very important, that if I want to feel entitled, is to know who I am. And then, as that child of the Supreme, I inherit everything that God is. And so I am. There's nothing more that we need to do. Thank you, Sister Usha Jidan from the Brahma Kumaris. And I think that's just brought about a peaceful energy within the room. Okay, and uh, is allowing us to tap within ourselves and and find that innate peace that we all have within us and not to look for to the next person to provide that to us and just tap into our unique self. Thank you. Um, on that note, I'd like to request the revered Pravrajika Ishtaprana Mataji, the president of the Sri Sharada Devi Ashram, and uh, who, which is a monastic center for women based here in Asheville. And uh, Mataji will actually speak to us this afternoon on her experiences in helping women because the ashram is also dedicated to empowering women and, cho and children and also actually uh, extending a hand in quite a lot of humanitarian work within the community. Mataji.
Namaste and Om Namo Narayanaya to each and every one of you. I know there are many dignitaries here. My namaste to each and every one. And I'm so happy to be here this afternoon to share some thoughts on actually uh, Dr. Yogi Ji. I namaste to you, Bhai. He has asked me also to speak about Sister Nivedita and Swami Vivekananda, but Ma has said that I should mention a little about the work that we do at the ashram. There are many women that do come. It's obviously a ladies ashram, Shri Sharda Devi Ashram, and we are there for 35 years in Abilia Road. A uh, lot of women come with a lot of their problems. They don't know who to talk to. So we try our best to bring peace in their homes, to give them whatever they need, especially food and clothing we provide. And children, we ensure that whoever comes to the door is educated. If they do not have books, they cannot f pay their school fees, uh, they need food to give the children to take lunch, we make sure that we do not send any way, anyone away empty-handed. And we have many women that are members of the ashram and who serve the ashram wholeheartedly, with a lot of love. We have Ramayan classes, we have Bhagavad Gita classes, and of course, uh, as much as the families <coughs> as a whole come to the ashram, but women are there every day of the week. They come to serve, come to do seva, especially those that are at home find a lot of fulfillment in coming to serve at the ashram because they see that every week we give out over 20 or 25 vegetable packs to the poor families with you know all the vegetables in them. And every month we give out over 100 uh, grocery hampers via the schools and via uh, even individual homes. And also during Diwali, we give out about 400 packs of these hampers. So by the grace of God, a lot of work is done and a lot of people feel some peace and comfort and they have a place to come to. They have somebody to talk to and somebody that sympathizes or empathizes with them and can help them. So that is about that. But I am also very happy to discuss the topic that Dr. Yogiji has given us, uh, that is about uh, Sister Nivedita, the video that we saw was so informative, so enlightening, and I must acknowledge also that the speakers before me were really excellent. I really enjoyed every talk. It was so beautiful, so sweet, and I was so happy also to meet uh, Narati today. Uh, Swami Vivekananda, echoed the words of the Upanishads when he said, there is no chance for the welfare of the world unless the condition of women is improved. It is not possible for a bird to fly on one wing only. Swamiji knew that the standard of any civilization or nation could be judged by looking at the condition of women. And now we know that in ancient times, Women in India especially, but I am talking about the women in India, they played constructive and active roles in society. They were mothers, they were teachers, they were scholars, soldiers, judges, and of course they were, as we heard earlier, regarded to be equal to men in every way, and they helped to build a robust society. Swamiji believed that Indian women were the custodians of spiritual values. They withstood and bore the brunt of many invasions through the millennia. The contribution of the Indian women is so great, as we have heard, that she is worshipped as none other than the Divine Mother herself. Now, there are innumerable women in history, and some uh, of the names have been mentioned, like Mother Sita, who you know, the wonderful characteristics of purity, courage, and intellect have made them, have made them shape the ideal personality <coughs> in the Indian psyche. Of course, there's Mother Sita, there's Lakshmi Bhai, Rani of Jansi, and Gargi was also mentioned. History affirms that girls in those days went to Gurukul schools and had a choice to marry or acquire further knowledge 
which of course benefited the whole society. Gargi was one such woman who among others was respected by many rishis for her intellectual and spiritual achievements. Then came the deterioration of the position of the women. And there were several factors that led to this deterioration, two of which were the foreign invasions and of course the <coughs> attitude of the orthodox uh, Hindus that would not allow the girls now to go to school. They did not encourage them to study and forced them to marry. And they felt that women were definitely not equal to men. So thus, they lost the capacity to think independently. And as a result, society began to decline. Mothers could now not instill independence and fearlessness in their children because they themselves became superstitious and dependent on men. Thus, so this reduced a robust and fearless society to a superstitious one. In Swami Vivekananda's time, the social status of women was so low that they had lost all the rights that they had enjoyed in the Vedic period. Swami Vivekananda, the Rishi of this age, emphatically and boldly restored spiritual entitlement to Indian women. While in America, Swamiji was witness to, he saw this fiery, independent and fearless American women working relentlessly to build the nation. And after careful study, he realized that it was education that was the key to all success. So when Swamiji returned to India, he emphasized that women should be educated to develop a strong character. Swamiji said, I want our women to be educated, but not at the expense of their chastity and purity. Swamiji had deep foresight and insight into how to educate the women of India. He was determined to liberate the Indian women for he knew that they were the protectors of spirituality and were entitled to attain moksha or liberation, just as we heard that the men only shouldn't have that entitlement. And I love the idea that when we go deep within ourselves and when we realize the soul, then the soul is definitely sexless. It is only the outer covering, the body, that is male or female, otherwise all of us are definitely equal. So he felt that women should not be ignored or enslaved. And for this task, he appropriately, very appropriately, selected his Western disciple, uh, Miss Margaret Noble. Swamiji initiated her, as we have seen and we have heard, and gave her the name Nivedita, which means the dedicated one. And of course, she lived by this name till the end of her life, and she is known by this name, Nivedita, by millions of people throughout the world. Swamiji knew that no one in India could help him in this mammoth task because those who could did not see the need to educate women and others were too afraid to go against the public so they also wouldn't help. The seer that he was, Swamiji trained and empowered Sister Nivedita to help improve the circumstances of Indian women. Swamiji told her, you have a great future in working for India. What is wanted is not a man, but a woman, a real lioness to work for Indians, especially for women. India cannot yet produce great women, of course that is in that age, great women were already produced, but for now, India could not produce great <coughs> women. She must borrow them from other nations so that she could be again reminded of her greatness. Your education, sincerity, purity, immense love and determination make you just the woman that is wanted. Swamiji narrated to her the pitiable, pitiable condition of women in India and sought her aid in helping them. Sister Nivedita, 
acquired her spiritual wisdom and power from her guru, Swami <coughs> Vivekananda. Being an English woman, of course, she had no knowledge of Indian customs, traditions, languages, and so Swamiji ensured that Nivedita at least learned the Bengali language and knew about the Indian customs so that she could identify herself with India and work enthusiastically for India's good. Through Sister Nivedita, Swamiji made going to school a reality for girls after hundreds of years. Sister Nivedita was very blessed that her guru awakened the divinity in her and chose her to help India, especially the women. She wrote to a friend, I, will, I always said that a call would come and it has come. Apart from her own spiritual growth, Nivedita knew what she must do. She struggled hard to convince people to educate their daughter. She faced many obstacles since fathers especially did not want to send their daughters to be educated. They believed that this strange English woman will completely alter their thinking. But Nivedita was so dedicated that she went from house to house to persuade the girls to come to school to, see, to learn. Shishartha Devi, the Holy Mother, supported her fully. In fact, Mother Sharda addressed Sister Nivedita as my daughter. On November 13, 1898, the Holy Mother inaugurated the first school at Bagbaza in Kolkata and blessed Sister Nivedita that it will progress. This was the first step to spiritual entitlement, I would say, to re-again entitle women to their own spirituality, the power that they had and was lost. So Swamiji helped this to be awakened again and to liberate the women. Swamiji was also present at this function and Nivedita had such great respect for Shusharga Devi that she said, she really is under the simplest, most unassuming guise, one of the strongest and greatest women that I have seen. It is also so wonderful to know that Sister Nivedita practiced meditation for many, many years. Even when she was in England, she practiced meditation and she practiced this regularly. And so she was e easily able to inherit uh, Swamiji's traits all the spiritual power she was easily able to imbibe that. She showed courage and independent thinking, two characteristics of Western women that Swamiji greatly admired and that is what he wanted the Indian women now to be that strong as well. She did not bow down, that is sister Nivedita, did not <coughs> bow down to pressure for she definitely believed that Indian girls needed to be educated to live up to the best ideals of their own culture. The girls had to take their place in Indian society, not imitating a Western culture, which in those days in the schools in India, that is what was happening. And the schools were promoting Western culture. So therefore, you find that those fathers were not happy to send the girls. But Sister Nivedita <coughs> taught them their own culture helped them to feel proud of their own religion, their own spirituality. So the subjects that Nivedita taught at schools were, or that she introduced in her schools were, geography and botany, sewing, music and painting. These developed the faculties rather than impart information. Nivedita followed her guru's wishes until the end of her life. Today, the position of Indian women has improved remarkably. And I would like to also say that had it not been for Swami Vivekananji's foresight, there would not have been any ashramas for women. And so we too have been blessed in this country by this great movement to uplift the women and grant them spiritual entitlement. So for that reason, we also have an ashram in South Africa. And thanks to Swamiji, and we can only say, victory to Swamiji, victory to Mother Sharda, 
and victory to Sister Nivedita and victory to all my dear sisters and brothers also. Thank you. I think it's now apt uh, for the song that we're going to listen to by Kavita Ji, also from the Indian Consulate. Um, the, it's entitled The Perfect Pilgrim, and the song is <coughs> dedicated to understanding selfless, the selfless pursuit of um, the true self and the spiritual pursuit of the individual where selfless love comes in. So although we are, we have burning desires and we are living in the material realm, we are all destined for something higher with a spiritual purpose. And this song will now be sung by Kavita Ji. Namaskar. A very nice melody of song. If you want, you can close your eyes and then you can enjoy more. <laughs> without any instruments backing her up. She has a beautiful voice, doesn't she? 
Well done. Um, mm. Thank you, Kavitaji. On that note, I would like to also welcome to the stage, to the podium, the director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, the Indian Consul General's Office here in Durban, um, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi. And I think uh, Dr. Yogi Ji has come to Durban not too long ago, and I see that we are making such headway in terms of promoting cultural activities, and we are continuously interacting with the community. And uh, Dr. Yogi Ji has become more of a friend to all of us within the past months, and we're so happy to have you here and come forward, Dr. Yogi, to address us. रिवर्ड प्रवर जी का इष्ट प्राणा माता जी, सिस्टर उषा जीवन जी, मैडम उषा शुक्ला जी, मैडम इला गांधी जी, हॉल डिस्टिंग्विश पेस्ट, लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन, आई एम जस्ट फीलिंग द ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ऑल ऑफ यू हियर टुडे दैट वी हैव डिस्कस्ड the unusual topic, but very much required topic. And sometimes when we are living the life outside, then we feel that there is no need to discuss, discuss anything from inside. But we have discussed today. So we must congratulate each other for this brave work. What is the spiritual entitlement? I think when drop thinks that I am drop only and to drop think that I can become ocean then it is entitlement. Entitlement is there only that is the acknowledgement of entitlement. Drop is ocean, ocean is also drop, they are same that is the quantitative journey, qualitatively they are same. And when we are thinking about women, then we can observe that what is the problem in this entitlement. And that, that problem is, for men and women problem is the same, but that form of the problem are different. The problem is ego. <coughs> So when we feel that, uh, when bird is feeling that nest is my destiny, then it is the misery, it is the dangerous thing, it is the destitute and it is the misfortune. It is the misfortune for the bird. But if bird can renunciate the nest and can fly in the sky, then it is the acknowledgement of entitlement. And this is happening with the women in all over the world, that they are feeling that our duty is designed, assigned, given to us, and we must be confined in these duties, and we must not leave this nest, and this nest is our life. If we will leave the nest, then life is go away. So that lady who was very young at the time, Margaret Elizabeth Nobel left the nest without hesitation and surrendered the whole life to the feet of the Guru who was not elder than, more elder than her. He was only five years older than her. And he left the family, the country, the culture, everything she left. And she left, left all things for what? So we can think, if you are nostalgically thinking about India, then you, you can think that she left it for India. And we feel that this is the proud for India. But she left it for the ocean, for the vastness, for the unlimitedness, for the infinity. And she did it. She merged herself into the ocean and she became ocean. That's why we are feeling energy from her life now, even today. So, that is the thing only. 
the limitedness is the worldly life unlimitedness is a spiritual life entitlement is only the acknowledgement from within from inside when we are feeling that i have the wings but i can fly in the sky when i feel that i must be ready to leave this nest this limitedness and this thing which is especially for women considered as attachment we feel for all women i have experienced the life through the women uh, which are in my life also mother sister many forms but always i am feeling that they feel that attachment is love but it is not it is the big walls big untruth they are facing and they are living and attachment is bound to depression misery so and also deception and we are living that we are feeling that that is love and if smoke is there then there is no fire but we are feeling that smoke is also giving warmth to me so it may be fire and we are indulged in the smoke and we we normally spending the life in the smoke and we are not experiencing any fire so there is no love that is only smoke it is deceiving continuously to us and we are always trapped in this deception and that deception is also the attachment to the nest and then at that attachment is also the part of ego that is the great reflection of ego that me and mine is important for me and which is not related to me and mine is not important for me so margaret elizabeth noble renunciate everything which was related to me and mine she accepted everything which was considered as other and she accept, accepted it she lived it throughout the life till death and she did everything for the people who were not attached to her she accepted she left ramakrishna mission also and she joined the freedom struggle of india she became a revolutionary to the freedom struggle of india and the ramakrishna mission uh, allowed her uh, gave permission to her to remain the name nivedita otherwise she was not part of ramakrishna mission at that time because it was not uh, good for the ramakrishna mission uh, for, for participating in the political life of india but she embraced it because she was the person who was continuously experiencing and crossing the limits and that experience is the entitlement when we are able to encourage the limits of known the limits of attachment the thing which are attaching us which are limiting us are only stopping us so the bravery the courage the conviction which she had only to encourage the limits and not seeking any security from outside because she was having the strength from within that's why she was having the confidence she was having the confidence of doing anything in this this world without any support from outside vivekananda left and then also she was there in india she was living in the small street of kolkata and she was living very simple life from where she was getting the strength it is from inside and that was the entitlement she proved it she endorsed it she established it and that's why margaret elizabeth noble became sister nivedita and became 
a person who created again a voice like a lioness and also Rabindranath considered her Lok Mata, <coughs> mother for people, mother of people. And the small age, 43 years old, she died. But she did the work which is more important than many ages. And that is the entitlement she proved, I think, in this auditorium. Everybody who is sitting and who is listening and who is observing and experiencing this kind of energy from Sister Nevitita through all the speakers. We all are having the same entitlement. Only the dropness is obstacle. The attachment to the nest. <coughs> and if when we will deal with this attachment as futility, then we will be able to fly in the sky fearlessly like Nevedita. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Yogi. And I think from all our speakers this afternoon and all our presentations, and, you know, it's a common theme that runs through. And I think there's so many women out there, like Sister Nevedita, who's come across, you know, and, and sacrifice so much for the empowerment of women and uh, understanding. And that brings us back to our Women's Forum, as I mentioned to you, which I'm the chairperson of the Hare Krishna Temple. And as you know, that the founder of ISKCON is uh, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. And an interesting story is that Srila Prabhupada left India and boarded the ship, the Jaladuta ship, and had gone to the West. And when he had gone to America single-handedly with only a few dollars and with the Bhagavad Gita with him, did he go and sit under a tree and start chanting the Mahamantra. And at that time, there were so many of the Westerners who came interested in this knowledge of what is this man doing? What is this yogi doing? Who is he here in America? And at that time, it was the time of the hippies. And how many women were attracted to this knowledge. It was actually many of the first of his first disciples were women and also learned ones all from America. The young American girls took to the chanting, took to understanding what is Vedic culture, understanding scripture, why do we wear the sari? And many of them then traveled across to the subcontinent, to India, and, and then took spirituality uh, so many of them even today are actually quite learned in understanding our Vedic texts. So this comes back once again to what we, we are saying that the energy is so important. And as Srila Prabhupada and as our great leaders have taught us that our false ego is what we are attached to. And if we defy that and if we go against that and if we start and the change begins with us, then we understand that there is no real um, disparity between the gender because it's all created within ourselves. So many women out there are making this change and with this energy and I think this inspiration uh, this afternoon, thank you Dr. Yogiji for getting us all together here and spending some time focusing and refocusing perhaps on what is important within the community. So our vote of thanks this afternoon. Sunita Singh, the CEO of Eastern Eye Magazine. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sharing your day with us this afternoon. It is really humbling to see so many people turn off and today is a Monday, and it's really amazing to see so many people here today. Thank you so much, and I don't have much to say because all the Matajis had such beautiful things to say today. Namaskar, and thank you for attending. Thank you. I think that sums it up.